Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Abner J. Mikva. Mr. Mikva served as White House Counsel from October 1st, 1994 until November 1, 1993. Prior to his appointment, he served as Chief Judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. He was appointed to the bench on September 27, 1979, and became Chief Judge on January 21, 1991. Before coming to the bench, he was elected to Congress for five terms, representing portions of Chicago and its suburbs. Judge Mikva served on both the Ways and Means Committee and the Judiciary Committee while in Congress. He started his political career in 1956 in the Illinois House of Representatives, where he served five consecutive terms. He is this year a Jefferson lecturer at the University of California. Judge Mikva, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Mr. Chrysler. I'm uh, glad to be here. Let's talk a little about your background and how you got started. Uh, what were the most important influences your parents had on you? Well, my parents were immigrants. Uh, they had immigrated from the Ukraine um, shortly before, during World War I. Um, they came over from these small little towns on the Polish-Ukrainian border. They were called shtetls, uh, predominantly Jewish villages. Um, they came over, my father was uh, very much influenced by the revolutionary forces that were then going on in, in uh, Russia. Ukraine was part of Russia at the time. The revolution, revolution hadn't yet occurred, but it was on, on the verge. And so he came over to this country uh, really with strong anarchist and atheistic hmm. tendencies so that uh, I, the, the household was not religious. My grandparents were very religious, my grandfather, but my father thought that religion was opiate of the masses, and so I never had any formal religious training of any kind. My grandfather would sneak me into the synagogue sometimes um, <laughs> when my father wasn't looking. I never learned Hebrew. I learned Yiddish because that was the language of the household, but I never learned Hebrew. And uh, one of the ironies of life is that I have a daughter who's a rabbi. <laughs> and I'm sure my grandfather, my father, her grandfather, would not be totally pleased with the idea of his granddaughter having and, turned out to be a rabbi. And did uh, both your parents, or your mother in particular, encourage you to seek an education? Yes. Education was, uh, uh, was the absolute the driving force in, in uh, their, their attitude toward me. I was the only son. My sister was allowed to finish high school and was sort of expected to go out to work. But um, as far as I was concerned, I was the, the prodigal son and they expected me to, to go to college. In fact, when I called my mother to tell them that uh, I had become engaged to my wife, uh, the first question my mother asked, she hadn't even met my wife yet, she said, does that mean you're not going to go to law school? And I said, no, <laughs> mom, I'm going to law school. <laughs> and were you educated in the Chicago public schools? No, or? in Milwaukee public schools. Milwaukee, I grew up okay. in Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, product of a socialist mayor during most of the time I was growing up. The pro I'm sorry? Of a socialist mayor. The mayor during all the years that I was growing up was a man named Dan Hone, mm -hmm. who was, uh, I saw in a rank, he was just considered one of the ten best mayors in, in American history. And, and, and what, so it, what, what drew you to politics? The example of this mayor or your father's anarchism? Well, both. <laughs> My father was, was uh, very much involved in complaining about the, the establishment. Uh, um, for instance, I, I was a great admirer of Roosevelt since I can remember. My father thought that Roosevelt had sold out to, to too many of the established interests, but as a result, there was a lot of conversation about Roosevelt and the New Deal, uh, about labor unions. Uh, my father was a strong believer in unions because he perceived them to be a, uh, a force for change. Uh, and so I was interested in labor unions, and that's how I ended up being a labor lawyer when I finished law school. What, what books did you read as a young person that, that stuck with you? I remember reading um, um, a, a lot of Dickens. I don't know how I hit on it as early as I did, but I remember being, being very excited about uh, Great Expectations and about uh, uh, 
Tale of Two Cities, um, and I seem to have remembered reading them even before high school. Now, I was an avid reader, and maybe I did. Um, but I read a lot of biography. I was fascinated with uh, reading about great people and how they, they got great. I had this, this image that, that, um, that everybody could be a Horatio Alger. All you had to do was want it badly enough and you could have these spectacular careers. And then, of course, shortly before law school, one of the things that influenced me greatly to go to law school in the first place was reading the, the somewhat fictionalized biography of Clarence Darrow. Uh, written by Irving Stone, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that just seemed to be, be such an exciting way to spend your life. A lawyer of the people. A lawyer of the people who could take on these heroic causes and uh, win them. And I found out, uh, sadly, later on, reading some other Darrow biographies, including his autobiography, that uh, it wasn't quite as as uh, simple as uh, Stone made it, and it wasn't all this great, up, uplifting, noble career that Stone had made it out to be. And indeed, a, a recent biography came out not too long ago um, that gave an even more grim picture of, of uh, Darrow's clay feet. <laughs> <laughs> but in politics, uh, as you went into it, you must have run across a lot of people with clay feet. Well, frankly, one of the things that, uh, that occurred to me as I began to realize that, that these people weren't perfect was that you could make a great contribution and, and do exciting things even if you did occasionally stumble. And perhaps Darrow was a classic example of that, but it was true of of uh, my political heroes as I got older. And I realized that Franklin Roosevelt wasn't, you know, when I was growing up, I can never, I never forget this, there was such a, a difference in the way people perceived their political leaders. I never knew that Franklin Roosevelt had a disability until he made his speech um, after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941. Until that time, I had never seen pictures of him in a wheelchair. I had never seen pictures of him looking anything other than this hale, hearty, um, enthusiastic president with the cigarette holder and the cigarette at the end of his, uh, in his mouth. And the idea of his having a major disability just never occurred to me. Uh, obviously, our perception of leaders is different today. Yes. <laughs> and, and is that, is that a liability? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I think that it really is important to a society that they have their heroes and that they can't just be figures of the past who are remembered for some great battle or some unique particular thing. You have to have live heroes, heroes that, that you have, if not seen, at least seen, uh, heard about in, in a more personal way than just reading about them in history. It's not enough to, to be exposed to George Washington in grade school or Abraham Lincoln in, in high school. You have to have somebody that you can identify with in the here and now that, that makes the institutions that, that we're trying to preserve worthwhile. Uh, your, your first uh, uh, political office was in the legislature in yes. Illinois, and, and Illinois was a, a, a state that produced an extraordinary array of heroes for your generation, Adlai Stevenson, uh, Paul Douglas, among others. Uh, did they inspire you, and did you know them? Well, yes, yes to both parts of that question. I, um, as I indicated, I grew up in Milwaukee, and I didn't come to Chicago until I started law school in uh, 1948. And Wisconsin has this, has and still has, had and still has this very open political structure. Um, the parties are very open and encourage new people to come in. There's no patronage. If you walk by a party headquarters slowly enough, you might end up county <laughs> chairman before the <laughs> night is over. And, um, but I'd been told by friends and others, well, if you go to Chicago, you can forget about any political interests you have because Chicago is this closed party, closed machine operation. And I accepted that as uh, the gospel. But when I came to start law school in 1948 and I came to Chicago, 
Adlai Stevenson was running for governor and Paul Douglas was running for senator. Mm -hmm. And it just defied all these stories that I'd heard that these two really fine candidates would be running for the two top offices in the state. Now, I didn't know that the party bosses had decided that 48 was going to be a <laughs> losing year and it didn't matter who they put up, uh, anybody that would help the assessor get elected and the, the uh, um, sheriff get elected, they didn't care about the governor and the senator. And I just was overwhelmed by the idea that these two fine candidates were running. And so uh, one of the stories that, that is told about my start in politics is that on the way home from law school one night in 1948, I stopped by the, the um, ward headquarters in the ward that I lived, and uh, it was a street front, and on the name was uh, Timothy O'Sullivan Ward Committee, and painted on the front uh, window. And I walked in, and I said, uh, I'd like to volunteer for, to work for Stevenson and, and Douglas. And this quintessential Chicago Ward Committeeman took the cigar <laughs> out of his mouth and glared at me, and he said, who sent you? <laughs> and I said, nobody sent me. And he put the cigar back in his mouth and he said, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. And that was the beginning of my political career in Chicago. But I, I did get to know them both. They were political mentors of mine. Uh, um, I, Paul Douglas lived in, in my ward and was a neighbor. And while we, our careers in Washington didn't overlap in Congress, we remained good friends all during the years of his life. Adley Stevenson, I still think, was one of the great wordsmiths of, of modern politics. I still quote frequently from his speeches, and I think he set the agenda, even though he lost both campaigns for the presidency rather, by rather substantial margins, he set the agenda for the things that we did in the 60s and 70s uh, in terms of easing some of the Cold War tensions and ultimately ending the Cold War. Both were really men of, of principles and values, and, and we don't see much of that these days. That's right, and, and both of them came into politics through the abnormal ways. Adlai Stevenson, his, the first office he ever ran for was for governor of Illinois, and, mm -hmm. and as I say, he ran because uh, uh, they, the party expected to lose, and he looked like uh, he'd be a uh, good symbol. Uh, Paul Douglas was a university professor at the University of Chicago. He taught economics and he was just outraged by the way machine politics seemed to be working in Chicago and he ran for alderman against the machine candidate and won. And uh, that was the start of his political career. And both of them, th they started out with principles, they had ideas, they had visions of what they thought they could do and what the country could do. And uh, they stuck by him. Uh, Paul Douglas, when he was first elected to the Senate, he said when he first came to the United States Senate, he dreamed he could re help restructure the world and he could recreate the United Nations and make it more effective and do all these other things. And by the time he left the Senate, uh, his main ambition was to try to save the Indiana Dunes because that he at least realized he could get done, <laughs> and he did. <laughs> You uh, have served in all three branches of, of government, and, and I want to walk you through uh, uh, those, uh, those jobs a little and, and get your reflections uh, on them and their interaction between them. Uh, but let's talk about Congress first. You, you actually represented two different districts yes. in Illinois, one a, a poorer district and another a very, if not the most affluent uh, district. Uh, tell us about those differences and, and uh, what, a, what it tells us about being a congressman, the fact that you could represent both. Well, it, in a way it was very complicated. I, when I first ran for Congress, I was running on the south side of Chicago, and the base of my strength was my legislative district, which was about a third of the congressional district. And it was in that part of the congressional district that I was the best known. I'd been in the state legislature for 10 years by that time. I'd been through five campaigns. People knew me. They knew I had a uh, legislative record. The press would refer to me, the community press, as well as the, the Chicago Daily Press. So that when I moved up to be a a congressman, I was an identifier to try to be a congressman. I was an identified person. They, they knew my views, they knew my positions. And um, it was interesting that that wasn't an altogether unmixed blessing. The big issues of the time were civil rights. Uh, 
And my district, while it had a, a modest minority population at the time, it also had some very heavy blue-collar ethnic hmm. neighborhoods who were very hostile to my efforts for open occupancy, public fair housing laws, and, and uh, employment laws, and so on. And, and uh, they were Democrats. Uh, they, uh, many of them thought their arm would fall off if they didn't pull a straight Democratic lever. But they were not happy with me as their candidate mm. for Congress. And indeed, the first time I ran, I lost in the primary, mainly because of the, those ethnic neighborhoods opposing me. The other big issue on which I was wrong for my district was the environment. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, one of the issues that uh, I was a leader in was keeping U.S. Steel from rebuilding a new plant, it's rebuilding its old plant in, in Lake Michigan and using up a big piece of the lake. Um, it was a good environmental issue and the environmentalists all cheered me, but there were 15,000 steel workers who ultimately ended up losing their jobs hmm. because the plant wasn't rebuilt and ultimately ended up moving to Ohio. Uh, and uh, the environment is not a great issue to people whose jobs depend on keeping the old, um, the, the old plant alive, even though it's an environmentally bad. Uh, it's the kind of example that people on the West Coast have as far as the logging industry is concerned, where the mm -hmm. loggers don't think it's such a great idea to save those redwoods, mm -hmm. especially if it means their jobs. But you got elected. I got elected, but uh, it was uh, nip and tuck. As they say, the first time I lost the primary, second time I won the primary. Once I won the primary, the district was just a safe Democratic seat. Uh, uh, there were, at that time, we still used the straight party um, circle in, in Illinois as far as voting is concerned. There were all these, these same ethnic voters who didn't like my views would just go in and pull the straight Democratic lever on Election Day, and I would get their votes even though they didn't like me. It was kind of a difficult uh, uh, tension, though, because, for instance, the big parade on the south side of Chicago is the Labor Day parade, not the Fourth of July parade, but because there's so many union and uh, working people there, Labor Day is always a big parade day. And whenever I would march in the Labor Day parade, there were these hmm. activist steelworkers very angry at me and yell at me about my votes on the environment and yell at me about my votes on civil rights mm -hmm. and make it clear that they weren't happy with me. But then uh, came 1972 and I was reapportioned out of that seat where for whatever its problems, I clearly would have been reelected as long as the district stayed that way. But it, uh, as a result of the 1970 census, they changed the lines, and my district was cut into three pieces. I was not Mayor Daley's favorite Democrat, and I couldn't really run in any of the three pieces of my old district. The piece I lived in was represented by a very popular black congressman by the name of Ralph Metcalf, a famous Olympic star. And I certainly wasn't going to run against him. I would have lost in any event. The middle piece, uh, of my district was where all these ethnic neighborhoods were, and it was represented <laughs> by another incumbent congressman whose record on civil rights was much closer to where the ethnic voters were than where I was. And the third piece was a suburban piece that uh, was basically a Republican district, and I knew there was no way I could win running there. And at that point, I decided to move 25 miles from the south side of Chicago to Evanston, Illinois, uh, and run in a new district that had been created, which was was uh, all suburban, and it was a very, very affluent district. As poor as my previous district had been, that's how rich this new district was. It was probably, it was either the richest district in the country at the time, or it was right behind Orange County in, in mm -hmm. California as the richest district. But the advantage I had is that a lot of my former constituents who had lived on the south side had moved out to Evanston hmm. and Skokie and, and uh, Northbrook and the other suburbs that were just growing up. And um, um, I thought I had a chance. Adley Stevenson had run for Senate in the previous election and had carried that district. Um, Johnson had done well there in 64 in that immediate area. So I decided to run. and. You mentioned Paul Douglas as being one of my mentors. I called him up to tell him of my decision. This was 19, early 72 or late 71. And he was already out of the Congress and was getting long in the tooth, but 
very concerned about my welfare. And he said, oh, my dear boy, that's a terrible mistake. You can't possibly win up there in the North Shore with your views. And you, you shouldn't do that. And then he started to recount how he had lost every election he'd ever run in in that area. And then he said, where are you going to move to? And I said, Evanston. He said, Evanston, that's the worst of them all. <laughs> and he said, rattled off the, the numbers that he'd lost Evanston by in 66 and 60. And I said, well, Paul, I think I'll carry Evanston. I, I think I can carry the district. It's going to be close, but I think I can carry it. Well, it turned out we both were right. I carried Evanston, but I lost the district that first time out. I lost my seat, and I was out for two years. And then ran again. Then I ran again in 74, and I won my seat back by a very small margin, and then ran in 76 and won by an even smaller margin. I won by 201 votes in 1976. Ran in 78 and won. Uh, and then in 79, I resigned to go on the court. You know, it sounds to me like somewhere along the way you, 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 you picked up a commitment to principle, actually, or maybe from your mentors or, or your readings, but, but also because uh, uh, it, it sounds courageous what you were doing, running in places where core ideas weren't uh, uh, necessarily uh, compatible with the, the feelings of important segments in your district. Well, because there there were pluses at the time, I, and I started to say before that as, as easy as my general elections had been in the South Side, and as hard as my primaries had been, when I moved to the North Shore it was exactly the opposite. In the primary I won overwhelmingly because the Democrats were my kind of Democrats. They were strong environmentalists, they believed in civil rights. My problems were in the general election because on economic issues there were a lot of, uh, a lot of people much more conservative than I was. But on the other hand, in both districts and all the times that I ran, there was a large core of supporters who made me feel good about the process, that I was really doing something important and they were mm -hmm. prepared to support me. And I have to say that there was always one issue on which Richard Nixon and I agreed, and that was, it's no fun to lose. Winning is better <laughs> than losing. Mm -hmm. And I hated to lose. But it still was, was a pleasant experience running because I had this core of supporters who were who agreed with me and thought I was doing something useful. So it isn't quite the self-sacrificing uh, chore that, that some people think it is. Uh, there was a great deal of psychic income that you get out of running for public office, even when you lose. What about the, the legislative side of this? You, you, you've written a, a text on legislating. What, what, what is the, the uh, the key ingredient in writing good laws? Well, I consider the legislative process the most fascinating um, human experience I've ever had. And this one did start back in Wisconsin. I was, uh, when I was still in high school, I was elected to something called the Badger Boy State. It was a mock legislature. <laughs> and we went to very um, gender oriented at the time. We had a Badger Boy State and a Badger Girl State, but I was elected to the legislature as a member of the Badger Boy State. We went up to Madison and pretended to pass laws for, for a day or two. And I was so excited about this idea of, about this notion of trading ideas with other people and, and compromising and working out you know, how you get to, to your bill to pass and how you support other people and their bills to pass. It, I fell in love with the process then, and that w was then and remains still the most, uh, the, the part of politics that I enjoy the most. I, I look back on my career and, and the days that I, that, that I knew absolutely that I was where I belonged was when I was in the legislature and the Congress. I felt like I was doing what I had learned how to do and that I could could do it well. And a big part of that job, I guess, is listening, uh, then compromising, and then putting it down in clear language and getting yeah. agreement. Yes, and, and, and you know, you used a word there that's, that unfortunately is given evil connotations, and wrongly so, the notion of compromise. People think, well, if you compromise, that means you don't have any principles. If you compromise, you're, you're selling out. And that's not the way it works in a large society like ours. There are 260 million people. We don't all agree on every jot and every tittle of our everyday experience. You've got on a brown suit. I've got on a, um, a gray suit. That doesn't mean that brown is better than gray or gray is better than brown, or that we have to agree. But we ought to be able to find a way to 
compromise our differences, especially on the important issues of what kind of health care should we have, what kind of social security should we have, what should be our foreign policy. And it's on those issues where people of principle can disagree without being disagreeable and find a common ground that allows the country to move forward. And that's what the legislative process is all about. And, and the prerequisite for that is really civility, right? Mainly. You, you cannot hate your opponents if you're going to sit down and, and, and work out an agreement with them. You have to respect them. You have to have some, some measure of trust in them. And you have to appreciate that they're coming into the, proper, into the, the process with the same good motives as you are. If you, if you assume that they're evil incarnate, that they're doing the work of the devil, it's pretty hard to cut a deal. Uh, how did being a legislator, a congressperson, and a, a state legislator uh, prepare you uh, when you put on the judicial robes? Well, I think it was the best preparation that one could have. Uh, I, I'm sorry that so few judges come out of the legislative arena these days. That wasn't the way it used to be. Uh, up to, well, certainly in the 1800s and even in the early 1900s, the traditional career path for most judges was to have spent some time in their state legislatures or in the Congress before they were appointed a federal judge or even elected at the state judiciary. And then there was this reform movement that started in the early 1900s and this democratization movement. We we're going to make the judges be more of the people and also be less political. And so we stopped using a political background as a prerequisite or as a credential mm. for getting onto the bench. So that by the time I came on, I was appointed in 1979, there were only two of us who had been appointed within the last 10 years that had come out of the Congress of the United States. A, a judge by the name of Bill Hungate from Missouri and I. Everybody else came out of academia, they came out of the practice, they came out of everywhere but politics. And I find that too bad because the legislative process is, is basically a big piece of what judges are reviewing. When I'm looking at a statute, I not only look at the words, I have to understand the context in which those words are being used because frequently they are not as straightforward and as simple as they might be because they're the process of a compromise that had gone on at the legislative arena. And if I, as a judge, don't understand that, then I end up saying, as some judges do, well, I'm not going to pay any attention to that legislative process. They don't know what they're doing. I'm just going to look at the plain meaning. If I can't understand it, too bad. But that's not what judges are supposed to do. Judges are supposed to try to carry out the, the will of the legislature, and sometimes that's hard to find. Do you, do you think uh, that helps us understand why there has uh, been uh, an, uh, uh, a dissatisfaction with the court system and with judges in recent years? I think partly so. I think that that judges tend to be too separate from the political process and the body politic. I guess the best example I can think of is uh, one of the great controversies of our time, uh, the abortion controversy, Roe versus Wade. Now, let me start out so everyone understands my prejudices. I support the result in Roe versus Wade. When I was a member of the state legislature, I was introducing proposals to to make Illinois law approximate what Roe versus Wade later on did. And that was going on in other legislatures. I still have a picture in my files of then Governor Reagan signing an, a California abortion reform mm -hmm. law, which pretty much accomplished what Roe versus Wade later on did. And he signed it, and the, the caption underneath was, this will get the abortions out of the back alleys into the doctor's offices where they belong, and all the legislators are smiling on him. Um, New York, Governor Rockefeller had passed a substantial reform law uh, with political consequences. One of the upstate l senators who provided a key vote in committee lost his seat the next time out. It was a hot political issue, but we were moving in the right direction. I'd passed the bill in the House of Representatives in Springfield. Uh, I couldn't get it out of the Senate, but again, it was moving. And then to our pleasant, to my pleasant surprise, the Supreme Court came down with Roe versus Wade where they pretermitted the whole political process and said, okay, as a matter of constitutional law, we're going to say that a woman has a right to, to choose and uh, if she decides she wants to, to um, 
have an abortion, she and her doctor can so decide. The result pleased a lot of us, still pleases a majority of the people in this country. But it angered that minority with a passion because they had just been short-circuited in, in their efforts to, to fight it out in the political arena so that you can't write a justice of the Supreme Court and say vote no. You can't, you can't even pick at the Supreme Court, though they try to do so. And there's this frustration that these five or six people, unelected, had made this basic decision, which, which had been the subject of political process for so many years before. The justices were surprised. The late Justice Blackman expressed how, his shock at how hmm. angry the minority was with, with the decision. I could have told him that was going to happen. And in retrospect, I wish the court had stayed its hand hmm. and allowed the political process to continue because we would have, we would have legislated the effective uh, Roe versus Wade in most states, not all of them, but in most states, and we wouldn't have had to pay the political price we've had to pay for it being a court decision. The people who are angry at that court are angry beyond measure. They, you know, as far as they're concerned, the whole system is rotten because they've lost their opportunity to, to slug it out. Uh, since you've worn both hats, that of a congressperson and a judge, I, th I think it's uh, fair for you to uh, look back and what I hear you saying is that the legislature is really, uh, uh, shall we say, primary in your view? That, that if you have a really difficult problem, it's best handled there and not in the courts? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think it's an accident that our founders put the legislative branch in the first article of the Constitution. And the reason is that, that they perceived it to be the first among equals. Um, most of the people who had been in Philadelphia had been members of the colonial legislatures, had been members of the Continental Congress, of the early Congresses, and they understood the legislative process. They knew how it worked, and they, they recognized that, that there was a direct tie between where the people were and where the, the legislative branch was. They didn't know what they were going to get with this elected king, the, the presidency. <laughs> they, they worried about it a lot. And they were nervous about the judges because the English judges had been pretty, had, had not been an unmixed blessing as far as the colonies are concerned. But they were sure that the Congress, what the Congress would do, and they were content to give them the primary responsibility for making policy in this country. And that's still the way the system works best. Now, the line between policy and constitutional principle is sometimes very, very thin. Um, People like me can say, well, it would have been nice if, if the court had stayed its hand in the abortion controversy. But I don't think the court should have stayed its hand in the segregation controversy in the great case of Brown versus Board. If the court hadn't acted then, we'd still have segregated schools in this country. We'd still have segregated railroad stations because the, the legislative process was, the political process was just absolutely frozen. Now, you weren't going to get Southern segregationists to agree to to change the the rules. So, so uh, uh, I hear you saying that uh, from in, from your perspective, the, the the courts can pick up the political ball, but only in a timely manner. Yes, and, and the, that that's exactly right. And the timeliness turns on is the political process moving and in a position to solve this problem. Or is this something where the courts have to intervene to save the republic and, and uh, to save the basic principle of the republic? And I think in the case of abortion, the court could have stayed its hand because the political process was moving. In the case of segregation of civil rights, the political process had, had been frozen. And if the court hadn't intervened, we'd still be where we were. Now, how you predict that in advance is a lot easier said than done. And it's understandable why the court sometimes moves too quickly to intervene and sometimes moves too slowly in intervening. Your third position was as counsel uh, to the President of the United States uh, in the uh, Clinton administration. Uh, uh, what, what did you learn from that uh, brief stint in the executive branch? Well, I learned that it wasn't as easy 
to get 250 million people to move in the same direction as I used to think it was when I was <laughs> a congressman or a judge. Maybe it was easier then. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was easier because as a congressman, I could reach my constituency. It was four or 500,000 people. I had a newsletter. I would campaign. And I, I could pretty much understand where they were going. And even if I was swimming upstream, I knew what I was swimming upstream about. I knew where my supporters were and, and where my, my opponents were. Uh, as a judge, it was simple. I wasn't there to make policy. I was simply supposed to interpret the statutes that others made. Um, review the orders that the executive branch had uh, handed down through its agencies and, and just be an umpire rather than a, a policy maker. But in both those positions, it was easy to criticize the executive branch, and I did, because it always seemed that the decisional process there was so, so ephemeral, so unorganized, so disorganized. You know, you'd have one agency going this way and another agency going that way. You'd have a president just sort of hamstrung, not making any decisions on anything. You'd have the country sometimes just sort of drifting into positions by accident. And as I say, as a congressman, I could write angry letters to the Pentagon or to the FBI or to the White House saying, why don't you do so and so and so and so. When I got to the White House, I realized that a president is trying to bespeak all 250 million of us. And we have lots of different views. And how you establish enough of a consensus to bring the country with so that you're not just out there by yourself uh, is a lot more difficult process than I thought it was. And, and is it a lot more difficult process than it was when you were, uh, say, in the Congress looking at the presidency? I think so. I think that the communication process is so much more instantaneous and so much more far-flung. <clears throat> when I first was elected to the Congress, and certainly when I was elected to the legislature, television was in its infancy. Uh, it didn't, it wasn't that big a factor in elections or in molding public opinion as it is today. Um, we had some uh, talk shows uh, that were on both television and radio that had uh, an inordinate effect on the political process, but not anywhere near as many as we do now, where people's views are molded by what is said on Sunday morning on some of these shows uh, populated by these instant experts who've never thought about the problem until five minutes before they go on the television show. And it's very hard to, to move public opinion when you have these communication forces which are, which are not within the presidential control and shouldn't be, but which just sort of get the American people to glom onto a position um, without a lot of thought, without a lot of careful preparation and without frequently without a lot of facts. I guess one example I would use is the this question of whether or not we should have a uh, what was called Reagan Star Wars, uh, the missile defense system. Um, experts have told me when I was uh, in Congress and when I was on the court and even when I was at the White House that that there is no way the defense can keep up with the offense and that's true of any defensive system. The Great Wall was a wonderful defensive system until they invented the horse. The Maginot Line was a great defensive system mm -hmm. until the Blitzkrieg. Uh, um, the Nike sites that we had uh, in many of our parks and, and uh, internal places in the country were a great defense system until they invented the missile. And I just don't think that, that the defense can ever keep up with the offense and therefore spending a lot of money on this Star Wars uh, system without being able to see what it is we're defending against and how effective it'll be uh, is a is a great mistake. But Ronald Reagan was able to move it very fast because he would make these very emotional pleas on television or during the State of the Union addresses or other times about how we needed this to protect ourselves against the Ruskies. And now President Clinton, Clinton is uh, moving that same direction. He's got a little harder job explaining who it is we're protecting ourselves against because uh, it's not the Russians anymore. But um, nonetheless, people are making up their minds for or against it without really knowing a lot of the facts, without really recognizing uh, 
what the alternatives are. If we put that kind of money into this Star Wars system, it's going to be at the expense of doing something else that some people would like to do, whether it's schools or Social Security or the environment. And these points of view are made so quickly and so so dramatically by our, our, our influence so quickly and dramatically by television and the other communications media. Uh, in your job, the, the biggest item on your desk must have been the, the pending, uh, 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 what was then called Whitewater and ultimately became uh, 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 the impeachment uh, of uh, President Clinton. Uh, what do you see as the political consequences of, of uh, this ordeal that we've just gone through? Well, it obviously has not had an effect on President Clinton's popularity, except maybe it has made it go up. Uh, I don't think it's because the majority of the American people approve of his behavior, but they sort of resent the what appeared to be a political effort on the part of the Republicans to undo the 96 election by removing President Clinton by him through the impeachment process. Um, I think the, the, the basic, and I'm, I can't really predict what's going to happen in the 2000 election. I think there will be some individual congressional districts that will be influenced by how the members voted, particularly if they voted for the impeachment and for the removal. But um, I, I can't predict what effect, if any, it's going to have on the presidential election. I think that it has, the one prediction I sadly would make is that it has diminished the people's respect for the institutions of government, all the institutions, the Congress, the courts, and the presidency. We had no heroes come out of this impeachment process. Unlike the Watergate activities uh, back in the 70s, where even though the presidency was disgraced, Richard Nixon resigned in disgrace, the Congress came out with heroes. They were perceived to be the good guys. The courts came out with heroes. We made a household name out of a district judge named John Sirica. Um, there are no counterparts to that in this impeachment procedure. and. Uh, I find that very sad. Do you, do you think that the presidency itself has been especially hurt? Uh, there, there were there have been a number of uh, court decisions of the court in the course of this ordeal. For example, on executive uh, uh, privilege, that suggests that there will be long-term consequences for that institution. Oh, I think that the the consequences thus far, as far as the court decisions are concerned, are very very bad. Uh, you mentioned executive privilege. It really, uh, I think that a president and his advisors have to realize from here on in that anything they say or do is going to be subject to, to um, inquiry, not only by the Congress, but by grand juries, uh, that there really is no privilege as far as advice you give to the president or that the president seeks. That makes it a lot harder for the president to get the the uh, different kinds of views that he ought to get uh, when he's making the, some of these monumental decisions. I think that uh, some of the smaller things uh, are going to loom large in the presidential horizon. For example, um, the, the court holding that there is no privilege in the part of the Secret Service in terms of disclosing what it is they see. Presidents notoriously resist the the desire of the Secret Service to protect the president as much as they think is necessary. I saw President Clinton resist many of the things that the Secret Service wanted to do. I remember the argument that went on for weeks before he would agree to letting Pennsylvania Avenue be closed up because no president likes to be isolated from the people and, and feel that his every move he's being surrounded by guards and they never can ro work a rope line and never can press the flesh, and never can look at somebody and talk to somebody. And I think that, that the fact that the courts have held that there is no Secret Service privilege means that uh, presidents are going to be that much more resistant than the efforts of the Secret Service to protect them. I think there's going to be a, uh, a substantial impact on the presidency from the courts holding that uh, a president is not immune from from uh, being sued while he's in the White House. Um, while this president was sued by Paula Jones, I think future presidents will find somebody who wants their 15 minutes of fame by suing a sitting president. And if that court decision stands, it's going to mean there will be this chaos going on continually.
At the bottom line, as you said earlier in a presentation at the Institute of Governmental Studies, this, this was a, a political fight, one branch of the go government going after another. Does it bother you that so much of the discussion was really uh, in, in legalese, uh, lawyers debating, which, which uh, uh, in some ways obfuscated what was going on? Yes, but it's inevitable because the impeachment article sounds like it's a legal process. Um, uh, we inherited it from the British uh, just about the time they were abandoning it. They, I think their last <laughs> impeachment was in 1807, 1807. And we put it in our constitution in 1787. And they abandoned it because it was a political process there, couched in legal terms. And the then prime minister at about the time they abandoned it said, you know, if you want to bring down the government, use the political tools to bring it down. Uh, offer a vote of no confidence and that'll bring down the government. But don't pretend that there's some legal problems with, with my ministers. Well, we put it in with that same lack of, of precision uh, that the British had used it. The key words in the American impeachment process is high crimes and misdemeanors. And, and that sounds like a legal term. But you can't parse it as a legal term because high crime sounds like something serious, treason, uh, bribery. But misdemeanors <laughs> are traffic tickets. <laughs> and which do you mean? And so the result is we don't mean either of those. What we mean is political behavior. I, I told the incident earlier on that uh, I was in the Congress when then Congressman Jerry Ford was trying to impeach a Supreme Court justice who was unpopular with the uh, conservative points of view. And uh, um, my colleague, a congressman from Indiana, and I kept badgering Congressman Ford, who was, was a lawyer but had not practiced law very much, and we thought we could you know, joust with him easily. And we kept demanding he give us some legal definition of what high crimes and misdemeanors meant. Did it mean traffic tickets? Did it mean minor offenses as such as is meant by misdemeanors? And he fumbled and he hemmed and hawed, and then finally he said, I'll tell you what is an impeachable offense. An impeachable offense is anything that 218 members of the House say it is, which is majority of the House. And in retrospect, <coughs> he's right, because basically the impeachment process is the process by which one political branch, the Congress, decides to superimpose its view on the other political branch, the presidency, to the point of trumping, negating the previous presidential election. And that's a political process. You can't make that a legal process, no matter how hard you try. It's too dangerous. And, and in this particular case, it seemed like some of the actors were willing to burn the White House down, figuratively. Well, there are people who are very, very angry with this president, angry to the point of being willing to engage in irrational behavior. Uh, that's the only way I can explain it. it they, and, and obviously, the less successful they were, the angrier they got. I think it frustrated some of the House leadership and House managers to know that the more they attacked President Clinton, the more popular he became. And indeed, his, his popularity numbers, his approval numbers, are higher than he would have any reason to hope for, were it not for the fact that a lot of American people think that he was persecuted by the by the. Republicans in Congress and their way of objecting to it is to show show the flag. When you entered politics, as, as you just described it, uh, it, it was a world occupied by, uh, from your political perspective, people like Adlai Stevenson, uh, Paul Douglas, uh, uh, the civil rights movement uh, was very important then in the legislation that, that you were a part of. Uh, what would you advise students today? What, what is your message to them uh, uh, about going into politics? Well, the first thing is to do it. Uh, I, I look back on, on the things I've done, and I wouldn't trade any of them for all the tea in China. I can't think of any way you can spend your time and efforts and, and uh, use your talents that is more satisfying in the long run and we're, than than being active in government, being active in politics. The example I used to give is if, if I have a point of view about something, if I care about something, if I care about the environment, if I care about, about uh, gay rights, if I care about how much it costs to go to the University of California these days, um, 
I can complain to my wife, who may or may not be listening, and maybe I can complain to my children if they're small enough um, and have made up their own minds, and that's it. And the result of all that complaining is I can hear myself talk, but not, not have much, much impact. But if you get elected to a legislative position, you can get up and say, I speak for 500,000 people. Now, they may or may not all agree with you, but you've got a forum where people are going to hear you. You've got the House of Representatives of the Congress to, to, to speak, and other members of Congress who also represent those large numbers of people will be listening. It'll appear in the congressional record. If you learn how to say it in a newsworthy way, it may be picked up by the press or by, the, by television. And you have just leveraged your point of view to make it heard by and hopefully influential influence a lot more people than you're ever going to be able to do just complaining to your family or writing a letter to the editor and that's true of appointed office as well your 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 ability to make a difference your ability to make things happen is just monumentally increased the the more you are involved in government and politics so that Unless you're completely happy with the way things are, if you've got something you don't like, there's no better way of changing it than to get involved in politics. Now, one of the things that's l missing today is we talked about this lack of civility, the odd homonym attacks that one results. Uh, what, uh, how should uh, students uh, relate to that phenomenon? Because it, it's very compelling reason not to do what you said, one would think. Well, I have to say that in, this, in the immediate here and now, I would find politics a lot less appealing than I did then because of this lack of civility. But, but we're a cyclical country. We didn't have much civility during the Civil War. Some of the names that President Lincoln was called uh, by the northern press, let alone by the southern press, are incredible. We've, we've used invective before uh, in politics, and, and then we somehow find our way out of this kind of craziness and start treating each other as, as, uh, as fellow citizens again. And I think that that, that that cycle is beginning to turn. I think that some of the really shrill, extreme voices in our political um, arena are beginning to to uh, be shut down. Um, some of them are losing, some of them are running out of voice, some of them are running out of money. Whatever it is, <laughs> I think that, that we're, we're going to be in for a more civil period in the future than we have seen these last few years. But in any event, students and others can change it. Um, I'm not a big pacifist, and I'm not a turn-the-other-cheek person, but but I found that I can get most of the places I want to go by treating other people in a civilized manner and that, that I can't outshout most of the shouters and I certainly can't outfight most of the fighters. So civility is an end in itself. Uh, I found that, that having a reputation of being uh, civil, of being a nice guy is not a bad way to get to where I want to go. You don't have to give up your ambitions to to do what you want to do or be what you want to be simply by uh, deciding you won't outshout the next person to get there. So how should students uh, prepare if they buy into your argument? Uh, wh wh what should they sh study? What experience would, would you advise as a prelude to politics? Well, I think they should study the institutions, uh, whatever, whatever particularly behooves them. If, if I had, um, I thought my choices made sense, and I still do, uh, law school is a great way to prepare you for the for both the adversarial process and the the civil process of negotiating and compromising that that is called for in politics but there are other institutions and institutional studies that are equally important political science certainly uh, reading about and learning about the historical events of these various government institutions and means of governance that we've used in the past both federal and state and local. Uh, religious institutions, uh, some of the most um, useful and interesting people that I served with in the Congress and the state le legislature were people whose training had been uh, uh, 
in religious schools. Jesse Jackson is a very active, involved, effective political figure. And he's a product of the University of Chicago Divinity School. Uh, if, if part of what they study might be uh, our conversation, and, and they had an opportunity to look at uh, your distinguished career, what, what lessons might they draw from it? Well, I don't know what lessons. I think the one thing that you, you have to, a choice that you have to make relatively early in life is, do you perceive the earning of a lot of money, the accumulating of a lot of, of uh, resources as an end in itself? If you do, then politics is not the way to go. Um, now, there are some people who have accumulated a lot of resources, who've used those resources to influence public opinion. I'm thinking of people like George Soros and, and Ted Turner and Ross Perot, and that is a way to get influence. Uh, I think it's the hardest way, and uh, I find it interesting that uh, Ross Perot has never been able to get himself elected dog catcher, and, uh, <laughs> let alone to a to an office where he has a real forum, the only forum he has is the one he can buy. So that I think that if that's the reason they made all that money, that they would have been better off trying to find their way directly into a political career. But early on, I think people have to decide, do I want to be the richest person in my class, the richest person in my community? Then it's true politics. Don't go into government. That's not, that's not where you're going to make money. I would hope that the public officials pay is commensurate with the minimum needs that a family need, has to educate children and so on, but, but even that's not guaranteed. And certainly you will never get out of there with money. But if you want to look back and say, I had fun doing what I was doing and I, I wasn't grinding away all the time making rich people richer or, or make, figuring out how many widgets I could make in, in an hour, then politics is a great way to go. I had a lot of fun in all these years. Judge Mick, well, thank you very much for joining us today and, and sharing these experiences and these reflections with us. Well, thank you. I enjoyed and, being here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.